I thank God for this time that God has given to stand here with the word of God. For the meditation this morning, I want to start with a scripture portion which is very familiar to all of us. Uh, it's Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. I think everybody knows this verse, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Praise God. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jesus was, during his earthly ministry, he was talking to a multitude and the disciples in a sermon, which is very popularly known as the Sermon on the Mount. And it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I'm going to mainly focus on the word righteousness for the next few minutes. This word righteousness appears in the Bible several times. Righteousness is not a word that we use in our daily conversation or it's not part of our lingo actually. And because of that, it may cause some kind of misunderstanding or things like that. See, the books of the Bible were written hundreds of years ago. And we may not understand some of the words and some of the meanings of the words that are in the Bible that were written a long time ago. Just like we hear this word, Loki. How many of you know the word Loki? Probably everybody who is not part of the Gen Z are shocked, right? What, what is it, Loki? What is the meaning of that? Right? It's, if not, if you don't understand the meaning, just check with the Gen Z, actually. Gen Zs are people who are older than 27, something like that. Or younger than 27, sorry. And so there is me, we cannot understand as times go on, there are different words, and sometimes we don't understand the meanings of the word. Anyways, King James Version, in the King James Version, the word righteousness is mentioned about 290 times, of which 200 times it is mentioned in the book of Old Testament and 90 times in the New Testament. In Greek, righteousness is called dikai suni. It is called dikai suni. It simply means living a life that is pleasing to God and in a right relationship with God. Living a life that is pleasing to God and in a right relationship with God. When we are in a right relationship with God, our thoughts are pleasing to God. When we are in right relationship with God, our actions, our deeds, they are all what? In pleasing to God. Psalms 19, verse 17 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, O God, be pleasing in your sight, O God. Be acceptable in your sight. As we all know, that we, God created each and every one of us as moral beings. Moral beings means we have moral nature. Or moral nature means we can choose what is right and what is wrong. So as moral beings, having a moral nature, we are supposed to be conforming to the character of God or to the nature of God, righteousness requires that we, the moral beings, conform to the character of God. That is why God created each and every one of us in his own image and on, in his own likeness. God created us in his own image and his own likeness. 
when we study the character of god god has several attributes god has several attributes there are some attributes of god that we can import in our lives some we cannot import the attributes that we cannot import into our lives are called the non communicable attributes what is it the non communicable attributes like self existence of god god is what self existing he does not need the support of anything even if there is no oxygen there is no walmart there is no costco god can survive but what about us we need what support all the time so that is the difference between the self existence of god and man human beings we who we need support all the time god is self existent and that particular character cannot be passed or imputed or imparted to us on the other hand god is present everywhere can we be present everywhere no god knows everything do we know everything no so those are the characters of god or the attributes of god that are non communicable but there are some characters of god that are communicable such as love and truthfulness and holiness those are the things that when god says that our oh, we should have right relationship with god our character righteousness requires conforming to the character of god those are the areas holiness truthfulness and love we need to conform to those attributes of the character of god let me take the attribute of holiness we are all familiar with the scale of 1 to 10 if we take on a scale of 1 to 10 the holiness where does god where would you put god as on a scale of 10 in holiness where would you put god at 10 we all know that right is god 10 only once a year no is god 10 only once a month no god is at 10 what all the time well i gave that example only for the purpose of illustration actually god cannot be restricted you think god can scale of god is 10 for holiness no maybe it is 100 maybe it is 1000 no 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 he is what infinitely holy god is what infinitely holy hallelujah so this infinitely holy god is warning that each and every one of us be what righteous we be what righteous hallelujah that is why in the sermon on the mount matthew chapter 5 verse 48 what did jesus say be perfect just like your father in heaven is perfect righteousness righteousness i have been very intrigued about this word righteousness because every time i go here and there I see this word righteousness but you see throughout the bible the word righteousness occurs many times so when we see god is saying that he is infinitely holy and when we need to be righteous it is a very tall order in the magnitude actually or the order of magnitude it's very tall it's very unchievable but god requires us what to be righteous that's why the word righteousness appears in the bible so many times in the book of isaiah he used the word righteousness so many times in psalms there are a lot of times i think over 70 or 90 times the word righteousness is used on one hand the requirement is that we be righteous but in reality what is our situation in reality what is our condition what is the reality romans chapter 3 verse 10 romans chapter 3 verse 10 there is none righteous no not one there's none righteous no not one we are to morally conform to the character of god but we are not In fact we are in such a condition we are morally corrupt in fact in some 
version that says, we are in a state of depravity. We are in a state of depravity. That moral corruption and depravity is that we see around us all the time actually. And David mentions that. I was born in iniquity. David mentions that. My condition is horrible. I am in a mari clay. And this theme we can see runs throughout the Bible. The corruption of mankind. The depravity of mankind. The question is, how can we achieve, attain righteousness when there is none righteous? How can we attain righteousness when there is none righteous? And this is where the book of Romans comes into play actually. Book of Romans. Paul, who was a Jewish person, who was a Pharisee, he was very expert in law. He was trying to achieve righteousness by what? By law. He was trying to achieve righteousness by law. And he was so zealous for that law. In fact, he was so zealous that he went on, took the step of what? Persecuting Christians because he was so zealous to fulfill the law. But what happened? As he was going and carrying the verdict from the high priest, as he was going to go into the city over there at the gate of Damascus, God touched him. God touched him at the gate of Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? You know what? That was the point when Saul became who? Paul. And he understood the fact that I cannot attain what? Righteousness by law. I cannot attain righteousness by law. And this is where the book of Romans is very helpful. When you study chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4, we can see where that aspect is brought out by He's, 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 he's kind of exhorting us. He's t- telling us that righteousness cannot be by law. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. Uh, sorry, uh, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Let's go to Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17. I'm going to read it here. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. To Jew as well as the Greek. For in the gospel of Jesus is what? The righteousness of God is revealed. Hallelujah. In the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed. I want to take a couple of minutes for that one particular verse. It says, the, uh, verse 16. Verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel of God. Because it is the power of God unto salvation. What does it mean by power of God talking about there? What is it talking about? See, we were in unrighteousness. The sin is reigning over us. Unrighteousness is taking a dominion over our lives. We are in the clutches of the sin and the dominion of the sin that we are shackled in it. And we cannot what? Come out of it. Paul says what? The gospel, it is the power of God for what? To salvation. It is the power of God to pull us out of unrighteousness. Gospel of God, gospel of Jesus Christ, it is the power of God to attain righteousness. Gospel of Jesus Christ, it is the power of God to crush the works of the enemy. Paul understood that. That one revelation... At the gate of Damascus. Children of God, do you understand? What is the power of the gospel of God? Gospel of Jesus Christ. Gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God to salvation. Verse 17. Gospel of Jesus Christ. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Righteousness. The righteousness of God is revealed. I'll come back to that. But before that, let me go to uh, another word in verse 16. Verse 16. What does it say? Gospel, it is gospel of God. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone everyone who believes. 
the gospel of god which is the power of god to salvation it is for everyone who believes see this word believe we have used it so many times we have overused it and sometimes we have negative connotation to of it to it and so now we got desensitized with this word believe we are very desensitized especially pentecostal community used to believe but what happened to the pentecostal community anymore it's, it has become more of a head knowledge believe has become more of a head knowledge i think to understand the word believe maybe we can use paraphrase to trust god to trust god if that is not enough to rely on god to rely on god maybe if that is not enough to depend on god to depend which means that you and i when we come into the presence of god and we say god all these things around me is not helping me i just want to depend on you i want to depend on you it is not a matter of heart then it is a matter of what it is a matter of heart it is a matter of heart that is why romans chapter 10 verse 9 says what it is a very powerful word that is used in evangelism what does it say believe in your heart and confess with your mouth believe in your heart and confess with your mouth when was the last time you believed with your heart when was the last time children of god gospel of god jesus christ he is the power of god to salvation to everyone who believes can you believe in the gospel can you believe in the power of god if you believe what is happening you will see the glory of god if you believe what happens abraham believed in god and it was counted as righteousness it was counted as righteousness if you believe in god john chapter 7 verse 37 says what out of his heart the rivers of living water will flow if you believe believe out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water hallelujah when was the last time you put your heart to believe god to believe god let us believe god now coming back to righteousness coming back to righteousness see we do a lot of mistakes in our life right we do wrong things and we come to god and we cry to god and what does god do he forgives us he washes us he cleanses us when i was preparing this message i thought god wow i did a mistake knowingly or unknowingly and i go into the presence of god and cry and god says what son i forgive you daughter i forgive you isn't that amazing isn't that amazing that he just forgives you does it shock you that he just forgives you we cry to jesus we come to him we depend on him and he forgives us god turns our unrighteous to righteousness he makes us acceptable in his sight what is it good in me that he is counting me as righteous it is thank god for the mercy of god every time we go into the presence of god with a broken heart and a contrite spirit and say oh god please forgive me and he he forgives us he washes us he cleanses us hallelujah 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 this method that god established is very simple to make a person righteous to make a person righteous it is not complex you don't need a doctoral degree you don't need a theological degree you don't have to be educated you don't have to be literate when we genuinely pray to god god makes us righteous god makes us our forefathers they didn't had much all they did is what they cried with their heart 
and God listened to the prayers and they counted them as righteous. Billy Graham, he used to preach in sign. Hundreds used to come to the altar call. Hundreds. And they cried and they gave the heart. God counted them righteous. We as a church on Sundays go out, pass our tracks, street preaching, personal evangelism. We hear people are saved. We hear people are saved. What is happening? When you talk to them, they give their heart to the Lord. And they confess their sins. And they become righteous. Hallelujah. Believe. Romans chapter 10 verse 9. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Then you shall be saved. I just want to bring a small story that I bore, bore, I'm borrowing from a preacher. Many times we don't understand, just like Pastor George Matthew this morning mentioned, that we get forgiven and we don't understand the depth of how much we violate God. How much we violate God. I'm going to give this story, this little story which I borrowed from a preacher. Imagine there is a little boy who, who wants an ice cream cone. And he goes to the store. It's not like a store like nowadays, big stores. We're talking about mom and pop shops. Little store. And the boy goes and says, I need an ice cream cone. And the lady over there goes and gets the ice cream cone and gives it to the little boy. And the boy pulls out. The lady goes, it's $2. The, uh, the boy pulls out what the cash in his pocket is. And he sees that there is only $1. And he gives it, he's ready to take that one dollar and gives it to the store lady. And imagine you are standing next to him. And this guy, boy wants this ice cream cone very badly. What are you going to do? You probably take out the one dollar and help him out so that you pay the price of the ice cream cone. Right? But imagine a scenario, another scenario. The boy is asking for the ice cream cone and he pulls out the dollar. Uh, the lady says, no, this is not enough. And he runs from there. He runs out of the place with ice cream cone. At that time, what is happening? That boy has violated the store owner. Right? The boy has violated the store owner. Now, if you say that, oh, forget, let that boy go. Oh, I'll give you the one dollar. It is up to the store lady to accept your one dollar and let that boy go free. It's up to you. What happened? In the second scenario, what did the boy do? The boy violated the store owner. Are you getting the point? How many times we violate God? How many times you violate God? In our thoughts, in our actions, in our all walks of life. We violate God. But what does God do? We, he keeps on forgiving us. He keeps on forgiving us. Hallelujah. Remember, when we believe with our heart, we are counted as righteousness. Remember that the righteousness that is given to us is bestowed upon us. It is bestowed upon us. It is transferred upon us. That is why for 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that it was paid by who? The righteousness which was on Jesus Christ, he is putting it upon us actually. It says, he who is holy carried the penalty of sin so that we who are unrighteous will become righteous. He who is holy suffered the punishment so that we who are unrighteous become righteous. He who is holy paid the debt so that we who are unrighteous becomes righteous. The English worship team and song team can come forward. When we are non-conforming to the righteousness of of God, the justice of God says, what about me? When you study righteousness, you have to study justice also. When you study about righteousness, 
justice was served for the non-conformance that we had. How? How did justice was served? Because God, who is holy, what did he say? I will be the one who is going to serve the justice. He put himself on the cross for that. Hallelujah. That is what we have to understand. So, we have been hearing about this message this past week also. Pastor John Vorgis, my dad, has mentioned about all the different sacrifices the Lord has done. With all this said, when the righteousness is bestowed upon us, and we are counted as righteous, what is our response should be? We should be morally obligated that we are no more the servants of unrighteousness, but we are servants of righteousness. Hallelujah. Remember, people of God, that God has called us for what? Righteousness. Amen? The gospel, it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. And by it, we have the righteousness that we need very badly. Hallelujah. And with that, I want to conclude my words and may God bless us. Amen.